obsession in China. China's obsession with Harvard and Western elite education. By Thorsten J. Patberg. It is no secret that the Chinese have a crush on Harvard. Naturally, high intelligence is drawn to elite universities like physical strength to top sports. And with overwhelming evidence from the social sciences that East Asians, on average, have a higher IQ score than whites, which results in higher SAT scores throughout the United States, of course, ivory towers now have come to salute outstanding Chinese applicants on a scale unprecedented in history. Harvard has de facto become a Chinese outpost. It is not alone. Whether it is the University of California, Berkeley, Yale University, or Cambridge University in the UK, those top schools brim with Chinese prodigies, relatives, princelings, or else engage in China-related research and cultural diplomacy. Good for China's elites, but there is a dark side to it, to brain drain. The latest piece of evidence comes from a $15 million donation to Harvard by a billionaire couple, Pan Shui and Zhang Xin, in order to establish a Soho China scholarship. This wasn't at all that newsworthy because Chinese donations like this to Harvard are somewhat common, you have no idea, but this one in particular sparked outrage on Chinese social media, or was it a well-orchestrated publicity campaign? As business people, Mr. Pan and Ms. Jiang surely expect some form of return on their investment, apart from the Soho name's sake and patronage, probably by getting one of their own into Harvard a family member, a relative, a friend, many friends. Most Chinese commentators would have little problems with that, as the caring for one's family and friends is an inherent component of the Chinese, Confucian, tradition. In fact, most critics would probably do the same if only they had the financial means. Xi Jinping, the country's president, sent his daughter to Harvard, and Bo Xilei, the former major of Chongqing, had his son enroll at Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government, where he made quite some headlines for his extravagant lifestyle, the cars, the ladies. This has confirmed what international observers had already suspected, that China's Taiji Dang, the sons and daughters of China's rulers, are mainly droning into the US Ivy League for the prestige and Guanxi, not necessarily for the pursuit of deeper educational ideals, letting alone an academic career. The critics' ultimate concern, however, is this, why not investing into China's education? Chinese students, together with other East Asians such as Singaporeans, Japanese, and South Koreans, have, on average, superior mathematics, reading, and science skills. This is readily available facts. No one is in the dark any longer. Even the UN study of the OECD's Program for International Student Assessment, PISA, confirms that much, students from Shanghai, Macau, Hong Kong, and Taipei are on top of the world. Why not their universities? There is something particularly alluring to China, and the rest of the world, really, in this American passion for Ivy League and elite education. That Americans' indulgence in this extreme segregation of their society into the privileged 1% and the 99% human soup is painful to watch, but a deep-seated problem in all Anglo-Saxon cultures. After all, the Anglo-British still have their monarchs, royalties, the unelected House of Lords, noble grammar schools like Eton, Charterhouse or Harrow, and their snobbish Oxbridge. In such a pathological class society, education isn't about knowledge, if it ever was, but about privilege. The books on the shelves are all the same. What is studied doesn't matter as much as where it is studied. US and British elite universities have thus turned into an exclusive club frequented by the US and UK ruling class, academic dynasties, the global plutocracy, Chinese top officials, the Jewish connections, Eastern princes and Arab sheikhs, and the sons and daughters of India's Brahmin caste. That said, since there are so many well-to-do Chinese students, China has more dollar millionaires than Germany, Britain, 
and Japan combined, they scatter and trickle down to second and third tier U.S. universities. In 2013, over 235,500 of them, according to the Institute for International Education. In the educational U.S. hinterland they quickly get bored, party, buy expensive cars, or help relatives with local businesses. Compared to their high-flying compatriots in the U.S. Ivy League, they clearly got the lesser deal, but still what they do, even if doing nothing extraordinary, together with all those American-born Chinese already in the country, is elevating the average IQ in their respective district or county. This has alarmed parents and guardians of other minority crowds in the country, and prompted a famous American scholar at Yale Law School, Kai Meyer, later joined by her Jewish husband, to write bestsellers about allegedly superior cultural groups. That scholar goes by the name Amy Chua, alias the Tiger Mom. And her writing is quite intimidating, too, Professor Chua, a former graduate of Harvard College, asserts that Chinese mothers are superior and more successful in the United States, her daughter, need I say this, also attends Harvard, due to a strange cocktail of superiority complex, insecurity, and impulse control the so-called triple package. That's of course total nonsense, the Chinese in China are not a stressed out minority group trying to overcompensate against a dominant white majority, yet their progeny have high IQs too. Cambridge University in England is another case in point. The Dons just love the Chinese. Cambridge recently made headlines again because of a whopping £3.7 million donation by no other than Wenru Chun, the daughter of former Chinese Prime Minister Wen Jiabao. The donation was non-transparent, through a shadowy Chong Hua foundation based in offshore Bermuda. Miss Wen made international headlines the year before in a bribery probe to Morgan Stanley, the US investment bank that. Well? Bribed Miss Wen what can we say? It's pretty normal for doing business in China. Apart from the brief public outcry, the deans of Cambridge University had no objection, of course, to the red money that's now being used for funding a prestigious professor chair, generous travel grants for friends and colleagues, and the usual wine, dine, and doing favors, and who can blame them. In fact, British scholarship depends on its China connection, just as Morgan Stanley does, granted, including access to much-desired sinecures and perks which are, after all, the butter and bread of academic life. England is a tiny country, and its economy is dwarfed by China, Japan, Germany, and even France. Yet its institutions of higher education are world-class. In order to make sure that this remains so, Cambridge University and other top schools such as Oxford, LSE, or SOAS are cunningly planning for the future of their prestigious candy shops, no less than the sons and daughters of the world's elites are pampered and babysat on that greater rock off the shore the European mainland in the icy northern sea, where the weather is a constant bummer. Great Britain offers generous scholarships which often go to Chinese students who are by definition already from China's upper social strata, they are wealthier than their local peers. They don't need financial aid really, but are naturally grateful for the kind consideration, to the dismal of Japanese students, by the way, who get little to no financial support based on the fact that Nippon is labeled a developed country whereas China is not. In fact, Boxbridge is heavily selecting its overseas students by merits of their nationality, which even further segregates their student bodies. At most major British universities there are now international dormitories packed with Chinese students, and those who look like it, literally, East Asian ghettos. This UK's desperation for new Chinese customers didn't get unnoticed in China's metropolises, where university freshmen already joke about which British school to pick from for their graduate studies Oxford or Cambridge. Neither of those institutions is considered particularly difficult, in fact, they are considered easy-peasy, a British sales scheme really, you buy a one-year master program, in China, a MA would takes two to three years, that everyone who pays passes. Moreover, English universities are far less competitive and selective than, say, Peking University, Tsinghua University, 
or Fudong University of China, all of which require Chinese candidates to score well into the top 0.1% of the Gaokao National Entrance Examination in any given year. Naturally, Chinese see a degree from Britain as some kind of real-time English course with a museum attached to it. Ah, and yes they can't wait to visit Berlin, Madrid, Paris, and Venice in during the term breaks. To which the cynic could reply, of course, that all those British surplus MAs and MSCS, as recruiters would know by now, were artificially created just for a very particular well-to-do East Asian clientele. Education is big business. The Chinese understand that very well. In fact, there are hundreds of agencies in Beijing, Haidian district alone, that help students prepare their application packages, including a fine resume, brilliant essays, and even flattering recommendation letters for going abroad. Most of them are so professional, even hiring Western expats as senior editors, that UK admission officers have no way to verify a single thing on those application forms, which in all probability, almost none of it was entirely written by the candidate him or herself alone. Beijing, meanwhile, is pushing hard to reverse the brain drain. Tsinghua University, for instance, has attracted a $300 million donation from the US-based Schwarzman Group as part of an initiative to train future world leaders. Tsinghua boasts some of the finest engineering and sciences departments in the country, and is often dubbed as the MIT of China. It is wealthier than Peking University, known as PKU or Beida, or Renmin University, its two main Beijing competitors, and it prides itself with having produced Xi Jinping, who is a former Tsinghua graduate, and hundreds of other technocrats that prospered in the Communist Party that now rules China. Peking University isn't holding back either. In 2010, it hired the former director of Harvard Yenching Institute, Tu Weiming. The American Chinese ethicist became a legend for having paved the way into Harvard for hundreds of his disciples. Now those are big in China, and have built an almost cult-like network of adulation, loyalty, and mutual support. Few outsiders understand the political game of elite academia, the necessary nepotism, cronyism, and patriarchy that keeps it all together. Prestigious and charismatic leaders raking millions of dollars, from government and businesses, that they must spend on generous conferences, favorable publications, and idiosyncratic projects, comparable to lobbying for Congress. And if they don't do it, someone else will, and pulls all resources away. There is an unspoken agreement that Peking University will invite any Harvard professor who is willing to visit Beijing for a guest lecture, and is expecting them to return the favor. Hence the by name, Harvard of China. In its eternal competition with Tsinghua, Beida now announced the establishment of its own future world leaders program the Yenching Academy. Top PKU leaders headed by party secretary Zhu Shenlu, a good friend of Harvard, mandated that the center of the university, Jingyuan Courtyard, a postcard place of magnificent green enclosed by six vegetated, traditional building complexes, is going to be renovated to house and groom 100 elite graduate students, 35 members of the mainland tribe, and 65 international students and application from Hong Kong and Taiwan, the so-called future Yenching scholars not to be confused with the Harvard Yenching scholars, but close in spirit and dear to the heart. Those prestige projects are but the drums of a new dynasty, China's so-called C9 League wants to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the American Ivy League. Already, Harvard in Cambridge, Boston, of Massachusetts, looks rather small and provincial compared to the mega-universities in Beijing, China's political, cultural, and financial capital with a population greater than that of the Netherlands or Australia. Peking University, China's mother load of higher education, has three, four, and five-star hotels, up to $500 a night, dozens of restaurants, moonlight and stardust conference centers, and even build an entire new global village district with 3,600 rental units for foreign visitors. And while Harvard may be filthy rich, better equipped, and more international, largely thanks to 200 years of U.S. imperialism, 
the United States are but a subculture of the European tradition, while Beijing represents the nucleus of an ancient civilization, it simply is the greater phenomenon. China needs, no wait, it deserves its own Harvard, and Cambridge University, Yale, Princeton, etc. It is entirely conceivable precisely because Chinese students have momentum, and a competitive advantage, which currently spurns them into succeeding anywhere in the world. But as long as the elites in China don't believe in their civilization and would rather invest their wealth in education elsewhere, nothing short of a miracle is needed to wake a billion people and this once so proud nation from its deeply historical slumber.